Gavin, how's it going, mate? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No problem, mate, no problem. So as mentioned, you retired nearly two years ago now. How has it been adjusting to life outside of football? Um, it's been difficult. You know, certainly it's not easy. Um, you know, I retired full-time playing as a professional for about five years ago. So then I went semi-pro, so like training twice a week and playing at the weekend. So I've had like a gradual, um, you know, move away from playing football. Um, I still play football on a Friday night with like my mates down the park, the over 35 league. Um, just, just to keep, you know, you keep in with the team and try to keep fit. You know, and I'll always play football, so that's been good as well, still to have the, the good dressing room and the good banter with the boys. But um, yeah, obviously you miss, miss full-time football. Was, obviously, I've done it for nearly 20 years. It was amazing. Definitely. So you're now the managing director of Tiger, is it? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Tiger, yeah. It's a French Tiger. company, so the H is uh, a little bit silent. So yeah, Tiger. Right, and that's a product manager and design consultation company. And you're also a director of sports careers, which specialise in helping candidates candidates further their careers in sport. So your wife is Australian, and you've mentioned in interviews in the past that moving to Australia was inevitable. But was this kind of career a path that you saw for yourself whilst playing football or was it something you found yourself having to do due to a new life down under yeah no I totally you know we always knew we were going to um return to Australia once I finished playing professionally so I played the last game of my career professionally in two, May 2014 then we moved in September 2014 um it was always a plan. We'd moved, we'd built, we'd sort of, we'd bought a house in in Sydney, 2007, just before I signed for Cardiff. Actually, just after leaving Rangers, just before signing for Cardiff, and I'd been coming to Australia since 2002 when I met my wife. So it was always a plan to come back uh, and raise the kids here. Um, so it's kind of different because if I'd stayed in the UK, um, I'd have probably went down the, the same route as probably everyone else. You know, I've got my coaching licenses. And I would have tried to get into football and continue being involved in football in a semi-pro or professional uh, level. Um, and I feel I could have done that. But I knew that when we emigrated that that pro it wasn't going to be an option. Um, there's way less roles in Australia. It's way more spread out. Mm -hmm. And there's not many full-time roles. So I sort of knew that it was going to have to be a different uh, different career. Um, and that was it was difficult to get used to. And, just accept that to start with but because I had sport careers I've always had in my mind that you know you've got to be open-minded and it's not going to last forever and you need to look at other options um so always being open-minded has definitely helped but you know I certainly didn't think I'd be where I am just now and, and doing what I do but I absolutely love what I do and I think that's a, the key thing you've got to find something that you really really enjoy doing um and luckily I've, I've found that. You went from a career obviously where you're playing in front of tens of thousands of people, you know, they, they probably isn't a buzz quite like it in life. How did you, you know, going into your career now, how do you try and find that buzz? Yeah, it's, it's certainly different. It's, that's something, you know, you'll miss. Um, so when I first started in my career over here, so I'd started in technology recruitment, you know, I've always had a keen um, eye for technology, love tech. And I went for a couple of interviews about, Two months after we arrived here and the guy who was my first boss he sort of recognized there's a lot of transferable skills from football and sports people in recruitment and not just in recruitment in any other walk of life in any business i suppose you know competitiveness tenaciousness you know your professional your attitude towards working so i um he gave me a chance and you know i thank him for it and we're still mates to this day and um it was tough for sure um but the, with the recruitment, when you're placing candidates into roles, so you're helping them with their career, you do get a buzz. And that's, you know, it doesn't replicate playing football no, nowhere, nowhere near it. it. Never, nothing will. But you still get a buzz from trying to help people in their career. So there's things you've got to sort of adapt and find the buzz in something else. And, you know, luckily I, I, I found it with recruitment to start with and, and then now what I'm doing. Awesome. So obviously the world is a bit, you know, mental, things are being turned upside down um, with the COVID pandemic. How has that impacted you yourself with, with your work? Yeah, we've, we've had a little bit tough as well. Um, because, so we employ people full-time and then contract them out to clients. 
So as contractors at clients, you know, contractors are normally the first sort of people to get cut. Um, and it was, it was no different for us. You know, we lost a few of our good clients and assignments. Um, I had to let a couple of people go, which is never easy. Um, but just to be sustainable, we sort of had to. Um, I think with the industry that we're in, in tech and digital, um, a lot of it can be done, you know, online at home. You know, the, the whole, lots of our clients who have got like 1,000, 2,000 people in their workforce switch to working from home within a day. And it's not manual labor, you know, so it's luckily we can still, still sort of do what we do remotely. Um, so that's been that's been one good part of it. Um, but yeah, certainly difficult and certainly strange times and, and getting used to it is very difficult. Yeah, Gavin, I just wanted to kind of go right back to the start of your career. Um, yeah. Your first club was Dundee. Yep. When you played there, obviously there was a bit of financial difficulty. You ended up moving to Rangers from there. Um, fee was, a, I've read, £250,000. Is that about right? Yeah, I think that's about right, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you moved, did you feel like that was helping the club? Uh, did you move for your own personal reasons? Um, how did that kind of manifest itself? Yeah, good question. I mean, it's it's all it's all of them things. Um, so about four months, so October, I moved in the January, and in October, the club that I was at, obviously Dundee, had went in, in administration. Uh, there's a lot of financial difficulty, and a lot of my friends uh, lost their jobs uh, quite quickly, which was horrible, including my brother-in-law and like mates I'd been through the YTS with for about ten years. So that was difficult. But at that time. I was playing for Scotland. I was playing every week Premiership in Scotland. Um, and I'd been getting interest from a few clubs. So I was obviously kept on as, as an asset. Um, so I, it worked out perfect that the club got money for me. And then I was able to move to a big club and, and, and really try and further my career. So it worked in terms of the actual transfer. It worked for everyone at that point. Yeah, um, yeah. And it was just good timing. When you first started with Rangers, you made your debut against Celtic in an old firm derby. I mean, how does that kind of, how does that feel? I mean, it's one thing to make your debut, I can imagine it's intense, but that would be a different level, I'm assuming. Yeah, it was, it was, it was difficult, strange. Uh, I'd signed on the, the 1st of January and the game was the 3rd, so I'd only had one session on the 2nd with the team and then we yeah. were straight into an old firm derby, so it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, <laughs> Sort of, um, you know, games like that, like the, the magnitude of that game is just, it's unreal. It's off the, off the charts, you know, it's one of the biggest games in the world. And to get thrust into it was uh, was exciting. I was looking forward to the game. But then I pulled my hamstring after about 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. And that was sort of a symbolic sort of uh, injury. And it sort of summed up my whole time at Rangers. You know, I didn't get off to a good, a good start, first game. Um, pulled hamstring, lost the game, and then it just I just didn't, never really got kicked off at all, really, which was disappointing. Yeah, with with the injuries, obviously a lot of players go through difficult patches with injuries. I mean, you you had that yourself. How mm -hmm. do you hand, How did you handle that? And kind of would you give any advice to anyone or any players now playing who have similar sort of experiences, struggle with injuries? Kind of that how you keep yourself going? Yeah, you've got to be like really mentally tough you know um i had played for about 10 years from when i started at dundee until when i left and signed for rangers with barely any injuries like nothing maybe i'd tweaked my ankle ligaments i'd had like a hamstring now and again but nothing major so i'd never really had to deal with injuries and then i went from that to rangers where i missed two full seasons um so i was like out for two years calendar years with injuries, with two different knee injuries and the hamstring. So that was tough, um, especially when you go to a club like Rangers and you're obviously wanting to make a mark, a beautiful training ground, and all I was doing was basically in the gym every day with the physios, seeing the boys, watching the boys training on this beautiful training ground and just not really getting to enjoy the transfer as much as what I would have liked to. Um, and you've got to be super mentally tough. It was really tough at the time. I had really good physios around me, good support. You need good support around you, but you've got to you've got to do it yourself, and you've got to knuckle down and and just keep going. And it, it's tough. There's tough days. There's days when you're just thinking, you know, am I ever going to get back? And this is so boring, just doing the same stuff every day. But yeah. 
you've got to keep going to just keep getting through that and be um, be just like continuously mentally strong and it is tough it's tough at times and within that time in two years I think the club had signed about five other centre midfielders you know so I'm seeing all these centre midfielders coming through the door and I'm thinking wow you know it's going to be so tough to get back in but that's the kind of club it is it's a huge club with you know massive ambition so it was tough it was a tough bit you learn and you move on you probably got a lot of respect from your fellow players though the way you handled that because obviously you were a, for a brief moment you were made captain weren't you I was yeah yeah, yeah. so when I came back um, there was a change of manager and then a few things went on with the existing captain Barry uh, Barry Ferguson was the captain at the time they'd sort of fell out with the manager and uh, I got to be captain for a few games which was amazing um, but I've always been like a hard working good pro you know that I, like I recognise that within myself I'm a good professional I love being a pro, I love, you know, I dedicate myself to the craft of being a professional footballer because I knew I had to. I'm not like one of these players that's got, you know, mountains of skill and, you know, natural ability. Everything I've got, I've worked for. So I always knew I had, I had to knuckle down and work and that was that was the basis of my game and what, what made my career, you know. So I always had that and I was always a good professional. Never really fell out with my, many managers. Had, had words with managers, had words with players, but nothing nothing major. Um, so I think most of the coaches I worked with would have recognised that and it was easy to get on with so sure. and growing up as a boy like you know did you ever think that one day you know especially in Scotland mm. Celtic Rangers two gigantic clubs there pulling on that Rangers shirt and captaining them as well that must have been such a proud moment for you and your family it was it was really proud it was um, strange circumstances because I wasn't even playing regular at that time and it was like it was kind of strange, the whole thing, when I was captain in Rangers, but to get to be captain of Rangers, even for one game, was great. I captained them five, five or six times. So, But yeah, no, you have certainly never never thought that growing up. So yeah, no, I was obviously very very humbled and proud to do that. What, what I don't know how much you can say, Gavin, to be fair, but what exactly, how did it go down? Because obviously Walter Smith came in and mm. that's when you you were no longer captain. It was back to Barry Ferguson, who was previously yeah. the captain. Um, yeah kind of what happens with the previous manager and, and how did you feel having kind of I'm the captain and then all of a sudden new manager I'm no longer the captain how does that feel yeah no listen it was listen I knew the story you know I'm not I'm not silly it was, a, it was a definitely a ploy to upset the former captain and a lot of people um, and you know as I say I got on with most most of my coaches and my he respected how much I worked hard and I was a professional and he made me captain. But like I say, I wasn't first pick. I wasn't even close to first pick every week. So it was a very strange, strange time. And I know you asked about, you know, were you proud being captain? It's probably one of the most nervous I've been, you know, because I wasn't playing. So I wasn't playing. I was out of the team. He made me captain then I was in the team. So I was in the team plus captain. So it was just like, it was so strange. And then the manager left about, like five days later and the biggest problem I've got with that is that he never spoke to me when he was leaving so it was like he made me a scapegoat made me captain and then he just left yeah. and I was just thinking yeah well that was uh, that was great and so you put massive pressure on me for just yeah. to make a point and then you've just gone and I was just like that's that's a bit slack so um yeah after that I was a bit, a bit annoyed but and then Walter came in and made Barry captain again, and quite rightly because he was the captain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with with football, obviously, I th I think what a lot of people want to know is we we touch on transfers when you move to Rangers, but how does it kind of go down when you are linked with other clubs? Do you have players that are already playing for those clubs that you know? Are you influenced by moving um, because of someone that you used to play with plays for them do they tap you up how does that kind of work I'm, I'm sure that definitely definitely happens it never happened with, it never happened with me I mean I knew loads of boys at Rangers I'd played with boys at Rangers who were in Scotland squads with me um, but never really asked them I was always I would always sort of you know lean on my own sort of feelings rather than anyone else but that definitely happens I mean there's no getting away from that I mean Berkey for instance Chris Burke coming to Cardiff, um, mm. you know, I knew Berkey really well. I was good mates with Berkey. 
still am. And Dave Jones had asked me about him. I says, I think he, I think Dave Jones had said to me that Rangers were looking to maybe let him go, or they were open to letting him go. And I says to Dave, I said to the man, just get him, just get him. He's quality. Like he's he's one of my mates, but I would not say if he was rubbish, he's a very very good player. Um, and that you know there is that can help, of course. So I'm reaffirming that, that Dave is obviously looking at him. He asked me what I think, and then I and I sort of reaffirm it. So then he, then it becomes a thing. So there's definitely things like that go on. Um, for myself, though, I've never never really had to lean on anyone. There was boys at, again at Cardiff that I knew. So you know you always know someone. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you, if you wanted inside info on something, you could get it quite easily. Yeah. You mentioned Chris Burke there. That's a great segue into why, not, why I want to ask you. I'm a massive Cardiff fan, Gavin. Um, you know, let's look at your time at Cardiff City. You played in that Cardiff City team that had the likes of Bothroyd, Bellamy, Kumas, McPhail, Burke, as you said, Whittingham and uh, Chopra. That season, obviously, you, you played for them for several seasons, four seasons, Um but that one season where we finished fourth, and you remember that collapse against Middlesbrough at home, obviously, how disappointing was it to have a team that talented fall at the final hurdle? Yeah, it was obviously massively disappointing. I mean, the four seasons I had at Cardiff was well, amazing times. You know, the first year we got to the FA Cup final, and then we, I think we missed out on the playoffs by a goal which was terrible the second season, uh, goal difference, and then we got to the final and then we got to the semi. Um, so in terms of relative success, but never really achieved what we could have, and that's frustrating. Um, but like you say, there was some fantastic players in that squad and um, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed my time in Cardiff and, and it was a great club and great city. Yeah. And you mentioned on Twitter that Ninian Park was one of your fondest memories at that point of your career. What was so good about that stadium for you to say that just like it was just proper old school just like a proper old school stadium like you know crowd really close um all packed in close together um the pitch was great pitch you know i just i just loved everything about it it just had a real authentic feel but as some of the newer stadiums you don't you can't it's very hard to replicate that and it's hard to get it back um and you, you see that with all the New York, New York stadiums, and it's not, not just Cardiff City Stadium, you know, um, all, most stadiums like that. Um, I came from, obviously, an unbelievable stadium in uh, Ibrox, which was old school but massive, um, whereas we went to Ninian and it was old school but tight and really, like, atmosphere. It was amazing. So I loved yeah. it. I loved it. You know, and then you do transition to the new stadium and great facility, stunning. Um, but you don't get, I feel we don't get the atmosphere in the New York stadiums and that's nothing like it's the you know, Cardiff City Stadium, that's just all stadiums I think, but Ninian Park was like proper old school, r- like raucous, you know, people on top of you, going to take a throw, just right on top of you and nothing better when, we're, when we were playing well and winning at Ninian, it was, it was amazing, I loved it. And Alex touched upon playing in the old firm earlier. What would you kind of compare and contrast the South Wales derby to that? Um, ah, listen, South Wales derby was, was certainly <laughs> uh, there's a lot of certainly a lot of hatred there as well for sure. I mean, there's there's no doubt in that, and there's really competitiveness and dislike between the fans and, and the clubs and you know all that. And it's, it's definitely there. I just think the old firm is for me is one of the biggest derbies in the world, if not the biggest. Um, it's just got so much history behind it, and whether it's good history or not, it's it's history that's there, and it's, it's stuff that's been around for hundreds of years, and it's it's uh, it's like no other. Um, the build up takes <laughs> normally goes for about two three weeks in the, in the newspapers up in Scotland, so it's it's next level, I feel. Um, but obviously, Cardiff and this one is not far behind at all. So a lot of Cardiff fans on uh, have been on social media recently. Um, mainly because it was, uh, you know, very, I think there was like uh, an anniversary of Joe Ledley's uh, goal right. against Barnsley. And a lot of Cardiff fans were on social media saying it was criminal that a Dave Jones team never got to the Premier League. How do you think Dave would have done as a Premier League manager? Um, I think he would have done okay, to be honest. Uh, he obviously had a lot of experience. You know, Dave Jones, his best, his best 
attribute, I think, was putting together a squad of players and keeping that camaraderie really well. But also the like the dealing with agents and making moves, like getting squads together, he was really good at a felt and with a really good squad of good, good players. Um yeah, I mean that the semi final was I seen it on Twitter as well, the memories of Joe and you just think, Wow, it's such a long time ago already. It's uh, it's crazy. But um yeah, no. Dave Dave was good at getting squads together for sure and like you like you mentioned, some of the players that we played with at Cardiff was, was outstanding, but just unfortunately we just never got to that next level. And one of the players you played with was obviously Peter Whittenham, a special player to myself and I'm sure to you, Gavin. Yeah. Um you had the honour of playing yeah. alongside, uh, you know, himself. What was he like as a person around the club and just how talented was he? Oh, his, his talent was a joke. Like, seriously, he's, he was just natural ability. Like, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, he, I think he, I think Wits was on loan just before I signed and then we signed the same season or he signed in January just before me. So we're both relatively new to the club and, you know, I got on great with him as soon as, I'm, as soon as I met him. I think everyone did. You know, he's a very likeable, he was a very likeable character, really laid back, like proper laid back. Um, nothing faced him and, you know, a, a wonderful footballer and just that left foot was just outrageous. And the, big, the biggest problem for me with Wicks was when he decided he wanted to be a centre midfielder because then I was thinking, right, that's me really struggling now because you know the, the, <laughs> we had, we'd obviously we had Aaron Ramsey there we had McPhail we had Wicks we had Joe ended up coming in the middle and I was thinking right okay this is this is going to be tough <laughs> it's certainly tougher because he had so much ability he could run games he was you know when we used to play old v young uh, games on the on the training park on a Friday it would be Wits and Rambo in the same team and you're just like yeah wow and they used to kill us. Like most of the times, they would absolutely kill the old boys. Um, um, a signature thing with Whittingham is that he never celebrated his goals. Like, wh- what was, why was that? Like, because we loved it as Cardiff fans, you know, saying yeah. he does what he wants, Peter Whittingham. But I don't think another, I've ever seen another player not celebrate a goal like Peter Whittingham did. Yeah, it, 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 that's just, a, it's, it's like his nature, it's like his character. He was, not interested in the adulation, you know, that wasn't what he was doing it for. It was just, he was just doing it, you know, he was just doing it. And don't get me wrong, he loved football and he enjoyed it, but I don't think he liked that other side of it where it was like where he was just the focus. He loved playing football and he was a fantastic football player and he would always produce the goods. But I don't think he was that bothered about the other stuff. It just wasn't him, it's just not his character. Um, but yeah, as I say, like his main, he was just so laid back, he was just chilled out. And you played alongside him at that 2008 FA Cup final against Portsmouth. What was it like playing an FA Cup final at Wembley? How did you get over those nerves, you know, that sense of pride? It must have just been, it must have been bursting with it. Yeah, it was, you know, sort of touched on. I never really used to get nervous for games at all. I always used to just try and, like, in my mind, just think, oh, I'm just like playing playing a game with my mates down the park sort of thing and just try and keep it low key and most you are at the end of the day you are just playing a game so just try and cheat like that. So but that that game was one game, you know, going out for the warm up and just seeing and knowing the magnitude of the game and playing the FA Cup final was one game when I felt well, you know, this is like like it's a big deal, you know, it's it's a massive, massive occasion and I'm being lucky enough to get selected to play in it. So it was a uh, it was an amazing occasion that you know look back on my career that I'm delighted to have played. Still frustrated with the result, and you know it could have went either way. We didn't. It wasn't a particularly great game from either team, um, but you know the run we had to get there and, and being part of it was something I'll always you know I'll always remember very fondly. Um, and when you look back at that Portsmouth team, <laughs> some team when you look back at their team, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so it's uh, you know we, we gave a good account but just they weren't good enough on the day and it could have went either way to be honest so back to kind of now and the future over in Australia what are your plans do you, do you kind of see yourself working out there and trying to develop soccer over there and trying to kind of grow the game or do you see yourself ever coming back to the UK um, you know you never never say never um, you know I've done so since I've arrived, I've done three years as an assistant coach. 
and three years as a head coach. Um, so I've had great experience, you know, I'm dealing with budgets, you know, signing players and putting squads together, picking teams, you know, tactics, keeping players happy. So you get, it's like, even though it's semi-pro, I'm getting a really good uh, learning and good grounding. And if I do become a coach full-time, which I would absolutely love, but like I say, it's very limited opportunities here in Australia. So for all that to happen, I would probably have to move back to the UK. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like I say, never seen ever. If something came of that, then yeah, obviously I would look at it. But you know, at the moment we're we're happy in Australia. I've got a, a role that I enjoy. Plus, I've got the football, which you know I, I could never give away. You know, I'll always do that at some to some extent. Um, but yeah, whether it's full, if it was you did. If somebody gave me an opportunity to get full time back into football, then of course I would jump there for sure. Yeah. Well, just to kind of finish off, um, we've got a couple of questions there, quick fire questions. So, I'm not going to give you very long to answer them. We okay. want your kind of most honest responses from. I'm very excited for this. I got to be honest. Um, they're not too risky, but uh, <laughs> we we want your your most honest answers. Um, okay. Right. Start off nice and easy. Um, I won't get, like I said, won't give you too long to, we'll try and get it out as quick as possible. Question number one, what's a realistic dream job for you? Full-time coach. Full-time coach. Champ championship. Premiership. <laughs> uh, who would you have loved to play for but never got the chance? Uh, Real Madrid. <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> Best player you've ever played with? Claudio Canigia. Worst player you've ever played with? Oh, there was a few. Um, <laughs> no, nah, that's, that's a bit harsh. There was a guy yeah. that, he, that we signed called Frank Van Ice. He wasn't particularly good. He was a Dutch boy, but he didn't last long. Uh, biggest dick in football? Biggest what, sorry? Biggest dick in football. Biggest dick in football? Oof. Joey Barton. <laughs> uh, who's the best player uh, to ever play the game? Maradona. Favourite TV show right now? Um, Ozarks. Favourite actor? Favourite actor? Um, De Niro. Most expensive object you've ever bought? Can't say house. Can you say a car? Yeah. Car. What car? <laughs> <laughs> um, before, my, before our twins were born, I bought a... Um, a second-hand Aston Martin. Lovely. Nice. Nice. I love that. I love that. Biggest fear? Oof. Dying. <laughs> uh, favourite <laughs> sport? Or crushing your Aston Martin. Uh, favourite sport outside <laughs> of football? Uh, golf, probably. Favourite singer or band growing up? Oasis or Chili Peppers. Great Hardest, choices. hardest thing about being a professional footballer? Injuries. Ghosts, real or not? No. Aliens? <laughs> nah. Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the best manager out there right now? Pep. Um, your favourite TV football pundit? Sooners. And just to finish off, biggest passion outside of football? Um... Family, family, of course. Brilliant. Good answer. Perfect. Thanks, Gavin. Awesome. Yeah, Gav, thanks so much for great. coming on, mate. That's, that's, that's everything. You're free to go. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Gavin. Appreciate it, mate. All right. Thanks, guys. Just before Stay you safe, go, man. Gavin, just yeah. before you go, is there anything you want to kind of promote? Anything you want to say? Anything you... Because obviously, you've got a, got a chance to promote anything that if you've got anything going on? Um, nah, I'm fine. I'm fine just now. Yeah. Yeah, nice to That's all right, no worries. No, thank you. All right, perfect. Cool. Nice one, Gavin. Stay safe, mate. Stay safe. Nice one. Bye. Bye.